Give me Teca, give me Encate. What's up, everybody? How's everybody doing tonight? Hopefully, great. Today, we have an interesting topic we want to talk about. We want to talk about Nahuatl in prison. In prison, California Department of Corrections. This is kind of a piggybacking off of our last uh, video on the etymology of the word Choloani, which had some connections with, you know, Cholo gang culture as it was being promoted by certain segments within that group. And I've been wanting to make this video for a minute because a lot of people, a lot of brothers, a lot of people ask me, hey, does this word mean this? What does this mean? Is this correct? You know, guys have done some time in, in, uh, in prison, uh, friends of mine, people online, wherever it may be. And um, a lot of time what they're asking me is, um, is incorrect sometimes it's correct uh, it's pretty interesting it's pretty interesting the whole the whole history and uh, the way that the language is utilized in prison and you're probably thinking like what now what in prison what well yes now what in prison and I'm not talking about now what speaking people uh, indigenous now what people who get incarcerated that's not what we're talking about we're talking about the use use of the now what language by certain groups uh, to facilitate you know the things that they do <clears throat> now this is nothing new it's a uh, every group segment within the California Department of Corrections kind of uses their own little language for covert purposes um, like with Africano brothers they utilize a uh, Swahili the whites they utilize like German and then the Mexican groups they utilize um, Nahuatl and what's interesting here is that of the two main groups that we're going to talk about, well, not the groups, but the variants that they use, they both utilize a different variant. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So before everybody starts saying, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't talk about the homies and all that. Like, hey, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the language and its use. And as far as my experience and knowledge on the subject, well... I am a Nahuatl teacher, I've been involved in the language for over 20 years, and the, the revitalization of the language that is, I've interviewed and spoke to OGs on both sides, um, some deep in it, some uh, no longer really in, involved in it, and likewise, I've done my own little bit of time within the, uh, you know, CDC on the level four yards and in the California Authority, and so I have uh, that experience too, first-hand knowledge. I guess you could call it first-hand knowledge. You know, I've been interviewed on the subject by linguist, and I know, um, you know, some some uh, individuals that were really influential and involved in in promoting the the use of the language within their respective groups. So that's just a little background. So this use of the language, I mean, now it's kind of been always used like words. Because Nawa is, you know, many words are in within uh, Spanish. And especially with uh, the Chicano movement, a little bit more uh, Nawa words became incorporated in, uh, in the way we speak or the way people speak in California in that Chicano um, urban culture, right? But as far as the language actually being utilized as a means of communication, that really began with the implementation of the indeterminate shoes. What that is, is that's the lockdown 23 and 1. Uh, you're not coming out. And this was this was done for various reasons to uh, kind of separate the leaderships of various groups from the main or general body of people. And so the Nahuatl began to be utilized in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s. One group did it first, then the other group, you know, I'm not going to say an invitation, but then they also started doing it. And interestingly, they chose two different variants. But it, in, at times, things kind of merge. So what's interesting here is not only how they use it, um, if it's grammatically correct, but um, but the, the way that they used it. So one group utilized what's referred to as classical Nahuatl. Classical Nahuatl is just a term. It's not like you know, classical Greek or or uh, high German or all these other terms that reference where other languages derive from. But classical Nahuatl simply refers to 
Nahuatl, as it was spoken in 16th central, 16th century Mexico central basin by groups such as the Mexica and related groups within that basin there. It was their way of speaking, which the Spaniards came in contact and referred to that language as classical Nahuatl. It's not any more uh, ancient or classical than our modern varieties, you know, but this is a term that they utilize to describe it. And some people have confused it, thinking modern varieties come from uh, classical Nawa or they're a corruption of classical Nawa because they're so different. That's not true. Classical Nawa was actually like an urban Nawa, which was made up of eastern and western branches of Nawa combining during the various migrations and co-mingling. Within this dialect, there were dialects itself or variants, if you want to use that word instead. There was the common speech, the Masewalatoli or Masewatlatoli. And then there was the more higher speech used by the ruling class. And uh, that was called the Tikpalatoli, Tikpilatoli, Tikpitlatoli, however you want to pronounce it. So there was differences. What we have, uh, most of the things that are recorded about classical Nahua are kind of uh, pushed towards the more... Uh, the more elite form of speaking, which has a lot of uh, reverential ways of uh, conjugating verbs and, and nouns and stuff, and so there was already there was differences within within the that that dialect itself. The majority of things written are in classical now or the way that the Mexica spoke. When the Spanish came, they introduced their uh, their Spanish orthography or letters, and then they made some slight changes to it to fit sounds that were in Nahuatl that Spanish did not have. Likewise, you know, it's alleged um, by some uh, very sharp linguists and scholars that they kind of, uh, they kind of played with the language in, in, in creating, you know, uh, a, a form of speaking, which we'll refer to maybe as colonial Nahuatl, that they used as a lingua franca for administrative purposes. So this language was used by the clergy and then and the govern government, I guess if you want to call it that, the um, those who uh, came here to control and administrate, to convert, to um, do their um, their uh, confessions and promote their religion, and so it spread. Now, Nahuatl was already utilized prior to this as a lingua franca, meaning it was used as language of trade, commerce, um, wars, colonizations by indigenous groups themselves. So it was already widespread, but this variant started becoming more widespread and it started influencing other groups. So the one group in prison, they utilized the classical. For whatever reason, they chose classical, probably because that was the main uh, sources available right uh, the primary works that they were utilizing were like the um, Yave del Nahuatl for those of who are familiar with the the books that were available at this time Yave del Nahuatl is in Spanish but it's like one of the top books you have to have if you're a student of classical Nahuatl uh, they utilize Carochi uh, his grammar um, Simeon his dictionary uh, later on, the Analytical Dictionary by Cartunian, and then the Foundation Course uh, by um, by Campbell, and then and then other sources. But this was all pre-internet, so it was a little harder. Books were and their books were expensive, so the books would come in, people would share them, write things down, and pretty much words lists were created, vocabularies were created, and then these were passed on from inmate to inmate. But in doing so, sometimes there was a corruption based upon the misspelling of one word can drastically affect the way that the word is pronounced. The second group utilized um, the Wasilinguil dialect, which is a modern variant of Nahuatl, referred to as Wasilinguil from the town that it originates from. And it's a, a variant of Huasteca Nahuatl. Huasteca Nahuatl is very popular these days. And uh, many people are learning it now nowadays. Um, it's from the state of Hidalgo, this one to be specific. And there's differences between these two. And so probably, you know, one group chose this one to be a little different.
but there's there are differences but they are basically mutually intelligible if you're speaking them correctly and uh, so that's what we're going to get into a little bit um now the level of fluency within individuals kind of depended on who you were and how hard you wanted to study you know because to under to to learn from a book is not not an easy thing to do but when you're sitting in the shoe 23 and, and one you have all day to do this it can be done and it has been done and there were some individuals on both sides that just had swift super knowledge and could hold a conversation uh, grammatically correct in the language in their both respective languages and I know that for a personal fact um, but most people didn't take it that far they would just learn a few words and some people you know would learn things maybe down the road that were just totally incorrect because it's kind of like that game you played when you're a kid you whisper something into one person's ear and it goes down the line and by the time it gets down to the 20th person it's a whole totally different uh, word or phrase and that's what happens with now I, I heard a couple guys on their channels um, you know saying some type of salutation at the beginning probably that they learned in um, in a prison and it's just gibberish it's just 100 incorrect and when you try to point it out to them in a constructive and a pro proactive way you know they don't want to hear it you know who are you this is the way the homies taught me and so that's some of kind of some of the things we want to correct here a common cop-out or excuse when you tell somebody or question some something somebody's learned you know is well there's lots of variants this is the way we say it and but but they're not able to pinpoint an exact variant. The great thing about Nahuatl is it's been recorded for 500 years, so we have basically ample material to say, oh, that's correct or that's not correct. Likewise, it's been studied intricately, analytically, by um, linguists and scholars for you know 500 years. And then there's the fact that there's over uh, a million fluent speakers in Mexico today so everything could be cross-checked so if you say oh this is the way it said um, well in what variant and from where like I heard somebody saying yesterday on, on or a few days ago about the Choloani he was saying oh well Choloani that's like the Mexican way to say it but the Nahuatl way is Choloane this for one is just goes against almost all the the um, the rules of Nahuatl pronunciation because stress in almost well any variant that I'm aware of falls on the second to last syllable Choloani Ani so in this case it would fall on Ani this person is saying Choloane so he's putting the stress on that last syllable that's incorrect okay. So like I was saying, everything can be verified as far as the pronunciation, how the the gram grammatical rules of the language, and you can't really make excuses like, oh, well, this is some variant, but I don't know what variant, and I cannot tell you. So back to the second group. They use the modern variant of Huasteca Nahuatl from a place called Huasilinguio, and it was from a, the Dictionary of Huasilinguio. It was written in uh, 1980. Um, and it was pretty it's pretty good material it's very interesting it's if you were to learn the it's like a packet it was two packets if you were to learn this extensively like really study in depth you would be able to have a grammatically correct basic conversation so the main problem though with both groups is the pronunciation because this was lacking you know you're learning from books you're not going to always get the pronunciation correct. Um, some of the common mistakes were placement of the of stress. A lot of times they will put the stress on the the last syllable. Um, for example, I'll give you a prime example here. The word for the land of the dead, right? Miklan, Miklan. They will pronounce it often. You hear it, Miklan, Miklan. 
This is incorrect pronunciation for the reasons I already stated. Another common uh, mispronunciation was like the X, not realizing that the X made an SH sound. So uh, uh, in, in Nahuatl, the X is utilized to represent the SH or SH sound like in Mexica or Mexico, today pronounced uh, Mexico, which, which still retains the X based upon the original uh, pronunciation. But you would hear people say, instead of saying Mexica, they would say Mexica. Instead of saying, uh, the TL was a big one too, instead of saying Nahuatl, they would say Nahuatl, Nahuatl. Uh, Atl, they would say Atl, Atl. Things like that. And then if you kind of say, no, that's incorrect, they would look at you like, what? Like, no, it's not Nahuatl, it's Nahuatl. Now what? But they wouldn't believe you because they've already been taught and everybody is in agreement, more or less, due to ignorance to pronounce these words in this way. Now, there was some individuals that really had a high level of, uh, of now what? Because, well, they studied it extensively. They was like going to the university. Then, when individuals who came from various Nahuatl speaking backgrounds, but were involved with these groups, they would help uh, kind of fix some of the mistakes. And I saw that with a few individuals from um, Guerrero and, um, and um, well, actually, just Guerrero. A couple guys from Guerrero that spoke Nahuatl, you know, more or less, their parents spoke it fluently, and they they became like help others to pronounce words correctly, even though the Guerrero variant is a little bit different as well. Um, it was still used. What happened though with um, the group that was using the Wasilanguillo is. Um, unless you were in like a certain place, a certain hole, um, as it spread to other prisons, um, it would be got mixed in with classical Nahuatl. So you had people using both. Give you a prime example. Um, in Wasilinguil, to say how are you is Kenikiti uh, Istok, Kenikiti Istok, Kenikiti Istok. While in classical, they say Kenentika, um, Kenentika. And you would have both being utilized um, and other words. Likewise, like if there was a word missing in the Watson and Wheel that they didn't have but they needed and they had access to a classical Nahuatl dictionary, they would just take this uh, word and, and utilize it for whatever purposes. And same thing with uh, the other group that used the classical. Um, again, they were not using the language as like to revitalize or some type of indigenous movement, the language was being utilized solely for the purposes of communication. Yes, there's a cultural tint to it. Yes, you feel a little pride speaking uh, an indigenous language for whatever reason. Perhaps you have that ancestry. Um, but that was not the sole purpose. And you can see the reason it's not the sole purpose is you know, they would change the, wor the meanings of words or they would add words or they would mix words or they would make their own words up. And then once the code was cracked, once the CDC, the, the officers kind of got got, a, uh, got on top of it where they started understanding what was going on, they started learning it. Then its use as, you know, it, it's, it's, its function as a language of code wasn't as important it was still utilized, but it wasn't um, uh, pushed as hard as it was. So I was looking up in my research. I seen an article online on um, basically a dictionary that was confiscated in New Folsom Prison um, in the 2000s. And it has, you know, a lot of words. A lot of them are correct and a lot of them are incorrect. But I wanted to share a few of them that were kind of, I thought were kind of interesting uh, because they show a prime example of one scribal error or mis miswriting of a uh, misspelling of a word 
can drastically affect what is um, how the word's pronounced. And if you push, if I'm writing the word list and I send it over to you know the next guys down the way, and I don't do it correctly, they're going to look at the word list and they're going to read it that way, and uh, it's going to be incorrect. So, according to this uh, this one, you know we have like. This is a good one I thought was kind of cool, like Atlat. Atlat used as a knife, a reference for a knife, right? Well, Atlat, uh, in, in English, they call it Atlato, right? Corruption of the Nahuatl. Atlat is the, the little spear-like device that it's a handheld, and you throw it, and it has a spear. And that's an Atlat. That's the actual... Uh, word and it basically means not a sling and that's where the word is derived from not a sling but they would utilize that for a knife maybe they didn't know the word for knife um, that's what they utilize likewise the word for a horse which in Spanish is caballo became in Nahuatl because it was adopted in the Nahuatl as caballo it was utilized in reference to like drugs like heroin heroin right uh, let me see. Some of these are kind of funny. Um, they have like one here. Uh, this one's supposed to be punk, which references to, I guess, to a homosexual. It's a quilonio. Quilonio. This is how it's spelled. Quilonio. Now, that's not really grammatically possible, that word, because an N before a Y in Nahuatl, it cannot be pronounced. It has to assimilate. Uh, so it would be a basically a word for a person um, homosexual would be a quinoni quinoni and they had other words as well that was just one that I ref that I seen um, in there um, so the two big ones right here these are the two big ones all right before we get into the two big ones sometimes they would take words that were not now on kind of pass them off as Nahuatl, like the word for coffee it is usually people will call refer to it as warichi warichi eh? that's warichi now this is obviously a Nahuatl because most all Nahuatl variants do not have r sounds warichi possibly it's from another indigenous language i don't know if anybody knows the etymology of that word go ahead and put it down there and let me know i would like to look into it but i suspect it's probably a purpecha word maybe because I uh, there was a lot of people uh, who speak that language incarcerated that put a pecha language from Michoacan uh, kind of like the word Warachi comes from their language but I don't know now what's really fascinating though is even though both of these groups are utilizing different uh, variants they kind of agreed upon the words to re reference to each other and um so one of the words like um, for uh, uh, South um, is Khan, according to this dictionary, right? And then the one for a, a Southerner uh, is Kampo, right? That's what they agree that that's what that means. And they use it. They blast it on them, tattoos, all that. Likewise, uh, the other faction, the North, they say Ishpo. Ishpo means Northerner, right? And, you know, they blast this tattoo on them, both sides. And in reality, both of these words are not even Nahuatl. They sound Nahuatl, but you cannot... They, for one, they don't mean North or South and, uh, in any variant. And two, uh, you're not going to find the word in any single, you know, colonial dictionary. So I'm still trying to find out what that etymology of those words are. Many people are. If anybody knows, yeah, again, go ahead and comment. But I will tell you this specifically, that if we're utilizing the classical or the colonial Nahuatl from the 16th century, the word for north and south are easily attested. Um, they are not Gampo or Ishpo. Um... Secondly, if we were trying to break these words down, the etymology of these words, just like taking them at face value as being Nahuatl, 
they have different meanings because the pole suffix, which is found in both, pole is usually um, a derogatory type suffix, meaning something big, like, uh, but in a, in a derogatory manner. Uh, so I don't know how it's how it was being used or how it was chosen. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Now, I have to say this though, in reference to directions within Nahuatl speaking communities, it's not uniform, but it is based upon the geographical location of each area. So north doesn't, it, it, there's not one word within every Nahuatl because it's descriptive, the language is descriptive. So north would sometimes be referred to as the uh, maybe a, like a, a, a town or something, a mountain or something in that direction. Some even could be references up and south could be references down because of the cosmovision, because of the belief system and how um, these uh, places were looked at according to the, each community. And east and west were usually referred to as, you know, the place where the sun set up, the place where the sun uh, sets, the place where sun rose, although there was other terms as well that were utilized. But these two terms, very interesting, are not Nahuatl. They may be a uh, fabrication of Nahuatl stems that were combined to create a word because the persons did not know or had no access or no understanding to say okay you know northern southern so these words were created interestingly both groups kind of agreed upon it and ref use them to reference uh, each other even though they're utilizing um, two different two different um, variants of Nahuatl um, sometimes words were be just made up and for example here I have I see here on the list here a small person is called a pili bol now a pili is now a term usually refers to what well, has two meanings it could refer to somebody of a high status and it could refer to a child so a diminutive as a suffix it would have diminutives a bol as we already spoke about means something like kind of big but in a uh, in a derogatory manner. Uh, let me see, what other words do we see on here? And I see like, this one says uh, Tuka. Tuka is a rat or a snitch, right? But then you can see that this is a, probably a, a scribal error for Tosa, Tosa, which is like a mole. So, and then sometimes the person wrote like here, the person word for big is they with the V, V E I. This is what they were saying the word big was, is they. The word is actually way, but you have to understand that the writing system of the 16th century of Spanish, they would utilize a V to represent what we would call a W sound. They would sometimes utilize a V. So, way, which today we would spell it as um, H U E I. Or variant of that or with some other modern they would say w-e-i way they would write it as they so if you're reading those old uh, texts maybe from Molina and you know his uh, 16th century uh, vocabulary he would write they or in the, um, the Florentine codex they but without understanding that that their their orthography that they were using the person just recorded it. Oh, they big. This is how it was. In, this is how it was incorrect. So many times people ask me, hey, "Is this correct? Is that correct?" Things they learn. Uh, most of the time, it's not correct. Most of the time, it's a mishmash of uh, of now what variants. Sometimes it is correct. There are some guys in there that did have it down packed. They were really uh, scholarly about it. I mean. Just like anything, there's super intelligent guys in there. And um, but if you learn something in, in while you did your time, you did your bid, you want to know what it means, if it's legit or not. I'm not the know-it-all, but go ahead and put that comment there. I'll find out. I have an extensive library, 
thousands of dollars worth of books. I guarantee you I probably own every single book written about the grammar, vocabulary, and language up into, you know, probably 2013. I stopped buying um, a lot of books, but then I started buying some more modern uh, variant books as my, uh, my goal shifted. And uh, I, I have most of all the colonial dictionaries as well, Garoche and Molina, and I've studied them extensively. So if I don't know, I'll ask my friends that are professors, other teachers, and uh, other friends of mine that speak uh, modern modern uh, variants too. Um, thank you for watching. Go ahead and give me a like. Uh, any questions or any suggestions, excuse the background noise. I'm in Mexico. I live here. It's super hot. Timo <laughs> Itasque.